Good day everyone, this is Dr. Soper here, and today I will be discussing our first topic in our series of lessons on information privacy and security. Before I get into the primary content of today's topic, I wanted to pose an interesting philosophical question. Namely, why is information security necessary? Although many of the investments that are made into information privacy and security are not related to malicious attacks, there is nevertheless an extraordinarily large amount of investment in information privacy and security mechanisms that are targeted toward protecting systems against attacks by malicious parties. From a philosophical perspective, I think it's important to consider what this says about humanity. On the one hand, it shows that we are certainly curious creatures, but on the other hand, I think it shows that we as a species are not particularly trustworthy, and we're also greedy. There are many people, organizations, and even governments in the world that would be very happy to steal personal or private information from you or your organization for their own gain. This appears to be a natural trait of human beings in virtually all cultures, and I think it's important to note that if we were not like this as a species, the quantity of time, money, and other resources that individuals, organizations, and governments must invest into protecting their information assets would be much less than it is today. With those philosophical thoughts in mind, let's begin. How dependent are you upon information and communication technology? Well, if you're like most people in the developed world, your day-to-day -day activities are increasingly characterized by interactions with technology. Computational capabilities are being embedded in a rapidly increasing number and variety of products, anything from athletic shoes, to kitchen appliances, to implantable medical devices. And what this means is that with every passing day, computers are controlling and administering and making decisions about more and more aspects of our daily lives. What we can conclude from this situation is that we are becoming more and more dependent on these information and communication technologies every single day. And this situation has very important implications with respect to our privacy and security. To better understand why, consider the relationship between our dependence on technology and risk. Because we live in a world where we are increasingly entrusting our lives and our livelihoods to computer technologies, and because those technologies are not entirely dependable, safe, or secure, our increasing reliance upon these information and communication technologies brings with it a great deal of new risks that were not present prior to the rise of the information age. As a discipline and as a profession, then, one of the major goals of information security is to find ways of mitigating these risks. That is, to allow us to have our cake and eat it too. Although many people think of the world of information privacy and security as one characterized by hackers, cyber terrorists, or government-sponsored information espionage. In reality, the scope of information privacy and security is much broader. And one way of understanding the breadth of this scope is to consider information security from the perspective of IT failures. Our modern information technologies can fail for many different reasons. First, consider physical failures. These are hardware devices, and hardware can and does fail. Even in the modern era, many of our computational technologies still rely on moving parts, and a failure of any of these moving parts can cascade to cause a wider failure 
of the information technology as a whole. Further, electronic components can fail. And when these components fail permanently, the cause of the problem is much easier to diagnose than when they fail intermittently. It is therefore important for managers and system administrators not only to expect that their physical IT devices will fail, but also to develop plans for how to address those failures when they inevitably occur. Beyond physical failures, we have other types of information technology failures as well. And these, I think, can best be understood by considering the intersection of two different dimensions. Along one dimension, we have a spectrum which ranges from malicious to non-malicious. That is, the source of the failure is caused by someone intentionally or unintentionally. And along the other dimension, we have a spectrum which ranges from harmless to catastrophic. Plotting these two dimensions against each other provides us with a geometric space in which we can easily classify our non-physical information technology failures. A failure then might be non-malicious and harmless. It might be non-malicious but catastrophic. It might be malicious but cause no harm, or, in the worst scenario, it may be a malicious attack that causes catastrophic damage to our information assets. Again, remember that information security has a broad scope, and information security addresses each of these different types of failures. What's more, information security addresses failures that have never before been seen or do not currently exist. And that statement, I think, speaks to the dynamism and constant change that characterizes the world of information security. So when thinking about information security, remember that it has a vast scope. We're talking here about protecting anything from tiny little integrated circuits all the way up to massive clusters of servers that may involve thousands of unique machines. We're talking about protecting a local private network that you may have in your home or your apartment, all the way up to massive wide area networks or even the entire internet. We're talking about protecting hardware, software, operating systems, databases, networks, etc. The scope of inquiry in computer security is vast, continuously changing, and ever-growing. Broadly speaking, however, we can think about computer security as being concerned with protecting information assets. And When we say information assets, what we're referring to is elements of the information system that have value. Since value lies at the core of where we should focus our information security efforts, a critical first step is identifying what within our organization has value and to whom do those items have value. One good way of thinking about information technology assets is to subdivide assets into three categories. First, we have hardware assets, and these can include our computing systems, mobile devices, networks and communications channels. Next, we have software assets. These can include operating systems, off-the-shelf application programs, mobile apps, as well as custom or customized application programs. And finally, we have data assets. These are our files, our databases, the information that we generate in our daily lives or in carrying out our business. And as we will see, it is often this class of assets that has the greatest value of all. When considering this diagram, remember that the perceived value of an asset depends in part upon the ease with which that asset can be replaced. Certain components of an information system such as hardware, mobile devices, operating systems, and off-the-shelf software can be easily replaced. By contrast, 
custom applications or mobile apps and our data are often unique and irreplaceable. Perhaps you can think of an example in your own life where you or someone you've known has lost say a laptop computer or a mobile device. Many times they are upset not so much about the loss of the physical device, the physical hardware itself, but more so about the photos, the course documents, the data that they had for work, etc. It is those files, those data items that represent much of the value of the system to its users. And we can understand intuitively through examples such as this why the value of an asset often depends upon the ease with which we are able to replace that asset. Earlier in our discussion today we said that one of the major goals of information security was to mitigate security risks. Another major goal of information security as a discipline and as a profession is to try to protect our valuable information assets. And in order to approach the study of methods of protecting these assets, we will adopt what's known as a vulnerability threat control framework. To begin, consider a vulnerability. This is a weakness in some aspect of an information system. If a vulnerability is exploited, it has the potential to cause loss or harm. And a human being who intentionally exploits a vulnerability is perpetrating an attack on the system. So an attack then can be defined as an intentional exploitation of a system vulnerability. Next we can consider a threat. Now a threat is simply a set of circumstances that has the potential to cause loss or harm. And as we will see shortly, threats and vulnerabilities are very closely related. Finally we have controls. And a control is something that we do or something that we have which helps to eliminate or reduce a vulnerability. Another name for a control is a countermeasure. Now, many people, when they are first learning about information security, become confused on the difference between a threat, a vulnerability, and a control. So let me provide you with a simple example that I hope will help you to remember the difference between these three concepts. Imagine that you are walking over a bridge. Whenever you walk over a bridge, there is always a certain threat to your safety, namely that the bridge might collapse underneath you. So the possibility of the bridge collapsing is a threat to your safety. Now, if there is a weakness in the bridge, say that there is a crack in the cement or the mortar between the blocks of stone from which the bridge is constructed has begun to crumble or deteriorate, those weaknesses are vulnerabilities and if those vulnerabilities were to be exploited the threat of the bridge collapsing would be actualized and that might actually cause you physical harm. A control then is something that we do or something that we have which helps us to eliminate or reduce a vulnerability. In this example we might apply bracing to reinforce the bridge or we may try to repair the cracks in the concrete thus reducing the possibility that the vulnerability will be exploited. Broadly then threats are blocked or prevented from being actualized by controlling vulnerabilities. Next I'd like to talk about threats and what has come to be known as CIA that is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This acronym, CIA, and the concepts for which it stands, is commonly referred to as the security triad. And we can think about threats as interfering with the confidentiality, integrity, or availability 
of an information system. Confidentiality, then, is simply the ability of a system to ensure that assets are viewable or accessible only by authorized parties. Integrity, by contrast, is the ability of a system to ensure that assets are modifiable or changeable only by authorized parties. And finally, availability refers to the ability of a system to ensure that assets are usable by and accessible to all authorized parties. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability, then, can also be seen as goals or objectives of information security, since together they represent three very desirable properties of an information system. While the CIA paradigm has been around for many decades, more recently, other desirable system properties have also been identified, and these are authentication, non-repudiation, and auditability. With respect to the first two of these, that is, authentication and non-repudiation, we are speaking here of systems that allow for communication or messaging with other systems or other users. And in this regard, authentication refers to the ability of a system to confirm the identity of a sender. For example, if you receive a message from your manager which instructs you to immediately stop working on the project that you have been working on for the past year and turn your attention to another project, you as the receiver of that message would like to be able to confirm the identity of the sender. That is, you would like to know that it truly was your boss who sent that message to you. On the other side of this is non-repudiation. And this is a property of a system in which a sender cannot convincingly deny having sent a message. Returning to our previous example, if you received such a message from your manager instructing you to immediately discontinue working on a project, and if we assume that your manager genuinely did send that message, a desirable property of the system, from your perspective, would be to ensure that your manager could not deny having sent that message. Finally, we have auditability as a desirable system property. And this is simply the ability of a system to trace all actions that are related to a given asset. That way, if something goes wrong in the future, we can trace backward through time and determine who did what and when in order to ensure that responsible parties are held to account. Next, I'd like to talk about harmful acts. Now, harm can be caused to an information system in four general ways. Through interception, for example, I might intercept valuable information flowing over a network. Interruption, for example, I might disrupt the information system's ability to carry out its tasks. Modification, in which I might seek to modify an information system or modify its information assets without being properly authorized to do so. And fabrication, in which I might fabricate an identity or I might fabricate new information assets for the purpose of doing harm to the system as a whole. Each of these four acts is a harmful act because it can affect a system's ability to ensure confidentiality, integrity, or availability. Next I would like to discuss some additional details about confidentiality, integrity, and availability, beginning first with confidentiality. When it comes to confidentiality, a good information security strategy is to adopt the need-to-know basis for determining who has access to data and when they have access to those data. Essentially, the idea here is that, by default, the user of a system should not have access to anything, and that the 
information assets or capabilities that they are given with respect to the system are done so only on a need-to-know basis. That is, we should provide system users and information workers with all of the information assets that they need to do their jobs effectively and nothing more. Another interesting consideration with respect to confidentiality is the question of how do we know if a user is the person or the system that they claim to be? And this question speaks directly to the difference between identification and authentication. We can think of identification as the process of proving that someone is who they say they are. By contrast, we can think of authentication as the process of proving that something is genuine or true or authentic. In the world of information security, it is often very difficult or infeasible to truly identify a real human being or a specific system. Instead, we commonly use methods of authentication rather than identification and we assume that the credentials being used for authentication are being used only by the real-world human being or system to whom those credentials apply. This is, of course, a risky assumption, since through malicious or non-malicious means, it might be very possible for me to obtain your login information and your password. And if I were then to use that information to log into, say, your social networking account, as far as the social networking site is concerned, I am you. By providing your credentials, the system is assuming that I am the real-world human being to whom those credentials belong. Similar to the need-to-know policy for data access, access to physical assets such as the server room or the network closet should also be granted only on a need-to-know basis. Confidentiality then is difficult to ensure with 100% certainty, but it is often the easiest to assess in terms of whether or not our efforts at confidentiality have been successful. When thinking about the difference between confidentiality and integrity, just remember that confidentiality is concerned with access to information assets, whereas integrity is concerned with preventing unauthorized modification of assets. Integrity, of course, is more difficult to measure than confidentiality because it is context-dependent. It means different things in different situations. And what's more, there are degrees of integrity. For these reasons, it's necessary for each organization to establish its own criteria by which integrity can be measured and evaluated. As with integrity, availability is also context-dependent, and this makes it a very complex issue. Put another way, availability means different things to different people. To a CEO, for example, availability might mean, can I access my corporate email from home? While to a data analyst, availability might mean, can I carry out my analyses in a timely manner without having to wait an unacceptably long period of time in order for the system to process my request. As a general set of guidelines then, we might consider an asset to be available when there is a timely request response, fair allocation of resources, fault tolerance built into the system, ease of use, and a good concurrency control strategy in place in order to address situations in which multiple users are attempting to use the same asset at the same time. To summarize our discussion of threats then, consider that threats can be caused by some natural event such as a fire, a power failure, 
an earthquake, a mudslide, a tornado, a sinkhole, a hurricane, etc. Or by human causes. That is, the threat is caused by something that a human being has done. In the case of a human-caused threat, the intention of the human might be benign or it might be malicious. As examples of benign or non-malicious intent, we can consider a situation in which harm is caused through a simple human error, or perhaps someone trips over a power cord, or accidentally deletes an important file. These are all examples of harm that is actualized through a benign or non-malicious intent. When there is malicious intent, however, that is, when a human being is intending to cause harm, we can then classify that malicious intent as either random or directed. And the difference between random or directed malicious attacks is simply whether the attacker is targeting a specific organization, individual, or entity. If a specific target is under intentional attack, then we can classify that as a directed malicious attack. Otherwise, if an attacker engages in a malicious attack and they do so without the intention of harming a specific organization, entity, or individual, then we can classify that as a random malicious attack. Who then are these attackers who seek to compromise the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of our information systems? Well, surprisingly, many attackers are simple amateurs. They act opportunistically. For example, perhaps they find someone's lost mobile device or laptop computer and they decide to look through the files on that computer. Or perhaps they are script kiddies or wannabe hackers who find hacking tools on some website that they apply to their home computers or the computers at their school or place of work. But outside of amateurs, we also have hackers and crackers, with the difference here being that hackers generally are attackers who have a non-malicious intent. They like to break into systems and look around or break into a system just to prove that they can do it. Whereas a cracker, by contrast, has a malicious intent. They're breaking into a system with the goal of causing harm, stealing data, disrupting the confidentiality, availability, or integrity of the system. Among these crackers, you may have career criminals, organized crime syndicates who seek to engage in malicious breaches of information security for the purpose of financial or other gain. More recently, we've seen the rise of cyber terrorists who are not necessarily affiliated with a particular state or government, but nevertheless are conducting attacks on information systems in support of some ideological or political agenda. And, of course, we have state-supported information warriors and spies. Most modern countries, including powerful countries like the United States and China, employ vast armies of information warriors whose job it is to try to spy on the governments or military organizations of other countries and collect intelligence through digital means. What's more, this is no longer just a minor consideration. In the United States, for example, the Department of Defense now considers cyberspace to be the fifth battlefield, the first four being land, sea, air, and space. And now cyberspace is considered the fifth battlefield, and a substantial amount of the nation's defense assets are being invested in efforts aimed at ensuring the nation's information superiority in cyberspace. Earlier we talked about the four types of acts that can cause harm to an information system. 
Now I'd like to spend a moment or two talking about harm itself. Harm refers to the negative consequences that can arise from an actualized threat. That is, if a vulnerability in a system were to be exploited such that a threat became a reality, what would be the implications of that actualized threat? This is a very difficult question to answer because the quantity or the amount of harm that is sustained from a successful attack is often a subjective matter. Different people and different organizations will assign different values to their information technology assets and with different values assigned to the same assets an identical attack would be perceived as causing a different amount of harm to two different organizations. What's more, the value of many information assets can change over time. Consider, for example, the value of the transactions that your bank maintains for your checking account. If a malicious attack were launched against your bank and the attackers were able to successfully delete or modify the transactions for your checking account that took place in the last few days, then we would almost certainly consider that act to have caused more harm, more damage, than if the same attackers had modified transaction data for your account where the transactions were eight or ten years old. This situation speaks to the relationship between the value of information and time. Most modern information scientists believe that the value of an information asset degrades over time according to an exponential decay function. And this simply means that, as a general rule, on average, newer data is usually more valuable than older data. In order for an attack to succeed, an attacker needs method, opportunity, and motive and you can remember these by the acronym MOM. So attackers need MOM. Method here refers to the skill, the knowledge, the tools, and so forth, which are necessary in order for an attack to be attempted. Opportunity refers to the time and the necessary access that is required in order for an attack to be attempted. And motive is simply a reason to attempt an attack. From an information security perspective, if any of these three items is eliminated, that is, if we're able to eliminate method, or opportunity, or motive, the attack will not succeed. Therefore, efforts aimed at defending against attacks on information infrastructure can target one or more of these three items, method, opportunity, or motive. Speaking more specifically, we have six approaches that we can use to defend our information systems. The first of these approaches is prevention, and this is accomplished by blocking an attack or by entirely closing or eliminating a vulnerability. Remember that attack occurs when a human being intentionally exploits a vulnerability. If we are therefore able to close or entirely eliminate that vulnerability, the attack cannot occur. Our second method of defense is to deter an attack. And deterrence involves a strategy in which we attempt to make the attack more difficult to accomplish. Our third method is to deflect an attack and deflection involves providing another target for the attacker which seems to be more attractive than the original target. In this way the attacker will pursue a target that is less valuable to us. Fourth, we can mitigate an attack. That is, we can take steps to make the impact of an attack less severe. If we are unable to prevent, deter, or deflect an attack our best strategy is to have mechanisms in place which will contain the damage. Our fifth method of defense is detection. 
and this can refer to detecting an attack while it is in progress or after it has taken place. If we're able to detect an attack while it is underway, we may be able to stop it, but it is also important to realize that detecting an attack after it has taken place also has great value. If we're able to detect an attack after it has taken place, we may be able to repair the damage, and what's more, we may be able to learn from the attack. That is, how was our system compromised? And we can then use that information to hopefully close a vulnerability, thus preventing a similar attack in the future. And finally, our sixth method of defense is to recover from an attack. We need to have mechanisms in place, such as backup copies of data, organizational protocols, etc., that allow us to quickly recover from a successful attack. If an attacker finds that the effects of their attack are quickly fixed, then they are less likely to attack us in the future. Next, I'd like to talk about the multi-layered approach to implementing controls or countermeasures for information security purposes. Consider a castle in the Middle Ages. Castles were often built in locations which leveraged natural obstacles in order to protect the castle during an attack. An example might be building the castle on the edge of a cliff, such that the side parallel with the cliff is much less likely to be attacked. What's more, castles often had a surrounding moat, that is, a man-made band of water surrounding the castle, which would help to further protect it from attackers. Additional controls included a drawbridge, heavy walls with crenellations at the top, strong gates, towers, guards who use passwords. Together, then, we can see that the defensive strategy for these castles in the Middle Ages was built around a multi-layered defense. And a similar strategy is used in information security today. We use controls such as encryption, software controls, hardware controls, societal and organizational policies and procedures, physical controls, etc in order to establish a multi-layered defense for our information systems. Physical controls are those controls which seek to prevent an attack through the use of something tangible. Examples might include walls, locks, security guards, security cameras, backup copies or real-time replication of data, or the implementation of natural or man-made disaster protection mechanisms, such as smoke alarms and fire extinguishers. We also have procedural and administrative controls, and these are controls which use commands or agreements that require or advise people to act in certain ways with the goal of protecting our information assets. So procedural or administrative controls might include things such as laws and local regulations, organizational policies, procedures, or guidelines, methods of protecting intellectual property, such as copyrights, patents, or trade secrets, and the use of contracts or regulations which govern the relationships between two or more parties. And finally, we have technical controls. And technical controls are controls or countermeasures which rely upon technology in order to help prevent an attack. These can include mechanisms such as passwords, access controls for operating systems or application software programs, network protocols, firewalls and intrusion detection systems, encryption technology, network traffic flow regulators, etc. When used together, the adoption of these different types of controls allows us to establish a layered defense and gives us the best chance possible of preventing harm to our information systems. Put another way, by defining and defending the perimeter of our system, preempting and deterring attacks, providing for the deflection of attacks, 
and then constantly monitoring for intruders and learning from their attacks, we can create an information security strategy which supports the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system while simultaneously mitigating many of the risks which are inherent in a world that relies so heavily on information and communication technologies. Remember, a layered defense strategy is best, and this diagram illustrates this philosophy. Many different attempts might be made at breaking into our system, and we have many tools and techniques available in order to limit the number of successful attacks. Outside of the boundaries of our system, we can use preemption or external deterrence methods in order to prevent attacks. And for those intrusion attempts that make it through our system perimeter, we then have internal deterrence mechanisms, deflection mechanisms, and if all else fails and the attack is successful, we want to be able to detect the attack and respond to and learn from it as quickly as possible, thus limiting the likelihood that a similar attack would succeed in the future. So a multi-layered security strategy gives us the best chance possible of providing a solid defense against attacks in light of the competing objectives of confidentiality, integrity, and system availability. Well, my friends, thus ends our introduction to computer security. I hope that you learned something interesting in this lesson, and until next time, have a great day.